Good morning. I'm Dick McCallum, president of DSU. It's my sincere pleasure to be able to extend greetings and words of welcome to you. We are so pleased that you're here. Last evening, we launched this symposium with an outstanding presentation by Dr. Brinkley. Today, when you look at the conference agenda, you realize that it is filled with terrific speakers, outstanding panels, and a number of other significant events and celebrations. I'm convinced that this day is a day that we will all enjoy and we will all be enriched by. I want to extend special thanks to the partners and the contributors who have helped make this symposium possible. Without question, we could not assemble this kind of event without support and collaboration from partners. I especially want to thank the City of Dickinson, MDU Resources Group, the North Dakota Humanities Council, the DSU Foundation, the Theodore Roosevelt Medora Foundation, and the Theodore Roosevelt National Park. All of these organizations have helped us to assemble this great symposium. I'd like to give them a round of applause. There are a number of dimensions to DSU's commitment to the Theodore Roosevelt Project. Later today, we're going to be sharing with you the status of our agreement with the Library of Congress. And Dr. Hudson will be with us from the Library of Congress. Again, that will be another interesting part of our symposium later today. So we'll look forward to that conversation after lunch. I'm now very pleased to invite our symposium moderator to the podium. He will begin by introducing our first speaker. Please welcome Clay Jenkinson. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our third annual Theodore Roosevelt Symposium. It's the fourth we've held. We held one in 1958, and John F. Kennedy was one of the speakers, but our recent series began two years ago, and this is the third. Uh, this is our symposium on Theodore Roosevelt, the conservationist in the arena. Just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. First of all, if you have a cell phone, uh, please at this moment turn it off. And for the young people and uh, non-young people in this room, please do not text during our sessions here. This is university campus. and. Very serious work is going on here today. We've asked speakers to come from all over the United States. Uh, this is their uh, academic work, and we've been waiting a whole year for this moment, and so we ask you to show them the deepest respect and forbearance in your own uh, electronic communications. We're delighted that you're all here. I think you're in for an extraordinary day. We're still watching the weather about tomorrow, but we feel pretty certain that we'll be able to go to Medora for tomorrow's sessions, but we'll keep you posted as the day unfolds. So far, the storm uh, doesn't look very dramatic, um, but things can change quickly. I have the pleasure now of introducing uh, Robert Morgan. We've been so eager for uh, Professor Morgan to join us. I want to read to you a passage from his uh, new best-selling book, Boone, uh, a biography of Daniel Boone. It's the opening passage of the book, and I'm, after hearing Douglas Brinkley last night, I just wondered, uh, Professor Morgan, what Roosevelt would have thought of what you have written here, because I think Roosevelt would have had conflict. Uh, he would have been, he wouldn't have been upset by what you've written, but I think he would have been conflicted about what you have written. Here's the start. Forget the coonskin cap. He never wore one. Daniel Boone thought coonskin caps uncouth, heavy, and uncomfortable. He always wore a beaver felt hat to protect him from the sun and rain. The coonskin topped Boone is the image from Hollywood and television. In fact, much that the public thinks it knows about Daniel Boone is fiction. He was neither the discoverer of Kentucky nor the first settler in the bluegrass region. He did not discover the Cumberland Gap, uh, known to the Indians as Oyesiota, 
nor was he the first white man to dig ginseng in the North American wilderness. And though he held the rank of lieutenant colonel in the militia more than once, he was for the most part a reluctant soldier and Indian fighter. I think if Roosevelt were reading this book and he would have gobbled it up perhaps in a single night, he would have been both delighted and upset because Roosevelt was one of those people who deeply mythologized Daniel Boone. Roosevelt helped to create one of America's first great conservation organizations, the Boone and Crockett Club, and Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett were iconic figures in the Rooseveltian imagination. And I want to just quickly tell one of my favorite stories about Theodore Roosevelt. When he was out here between 1883 and 1887, uh, he believe that he was in some sense embodying the spirit of Daniel Boone as he understood Boone. And when he came back in 1884, he asked young Lincoln Lang, who was about 16 years old at the time, to take him someplace where he could get an authentic buckskin shirt. It really mattered to Roosevelt to have a buckskin shirt. And he told um, poor Lincoln Lang the following. The fringed tunic or hunting shirt made of buckskin, said Roosevelt, is the most picturesque and distinctly national dress ever worn in America. It was the dress in which Daniel Boone was clad when he first passed through the trackless forests of the Alleghenies. It was the dress worn by grim old Davy Crockett when he fell at the Alamo. So Roosevelt wasn't going to be complete as a Western frontiersman, cowboy, and wilderness hunter until he was dressed as he thought Daniel Boone must have been dressed. So poor Lincoln Lang took him off towards Black Butte near Amidon, and there was a woman there by the name of Mrs. Maddox. And she was a, a sewer of skin. She could make buckskin shirts. She had recently gotten rid of her ne'er-do-well husband by hitting him on the head with a pan. <laughs> and she was a notoriously rough and tough character. And I'm just wondering, whether Theodore Roosevelt, who was now 26 years old, told her his story of the authentic buckskin shirt. If he did, I would have loved to have seen her reaction. Uh, Robert Morgan is an extraordinary uh, author. He's a man of letters, that greatest of titles in American life. He's written 11 books of poetry, eight books of fiction. In 2007, he was the winner of the Academy of Arts and Letters Award for Literature. He's the Kappa Alpha Professor of English at Cornell University. He's been on Oprah. <laughs> He's published books that, that are cherished. Uh, he just recently gave the Thomas Wolfe uh, lecture uh, just a few days ago. Uh, if you read his uh, biography, it's just filled with one award after the next. We are so delighted to have you here. Please welcome Robert Morgan. Thank you, Clay. Can you hear me? Is this microphone working OK? Well, I am absolutely thrilled to be here in Dickinson, North Dakota. And I would like to thank President McCallum and all the people who made this possible. I can't think of a happier occasion than to come here and celebrate uh, Theodore Roosevelt and the frontier. and. Uh, Daniel Boone. <laughs> uh, a few years ago, I was interviewed on the little farm in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina, where I grew up. And the reporter looked around at the old barn and the corn patch by the creek. And he said, tell me, I'm curious, how did you ever get from here to Cornell University? <laughs> because practically speaking, you can't get there from here. And I said to him, I know why you would think that. It's true, we were poor, we didn't have a car or truck or tractor. We plowed with a horse. We kept our milk and butter in the spring house. My parents did not have a lot of formal education. But I had some distinct advantages for a future writer. And one of the great ones was that I grew up among storytellers. Stories told on the porch in the summertime and by the fireplace in the wintertime. My grandpa had a 
endless store of stories about ghosts and panthers, he called them painters, and bears and mad dogs. And uh, one of his favorite stories was about a man who was going to get married and uh, he uh, was going to build a house for his bride out on the side of the mountain and he found a rock perfect for a natural hearth and built his chimney on that rock and the cabin around it. And they moved in on their wedding night, built a huge fire in the fireplace, not knowing that a great nest of rattlesnakes were sleeping through the winter under that rock. The fire warmed the rock up. The snakes thought it was spring. They came crawling out. The bride woke and heard this sound roused her husband to go see what it was, and he got out of bed and was bitten by hundreds of snakes and died. Isn't that a great story to tell kids at bedtime? <laughs> he, he would send us to bed terrified <laughs> with these stories. And he had a lot of others like that about panthers that tried to climb down the chimney and that sort of thing. And as a writer, I have actually gone back to a lot of that material. Uh, but my dad, an equally good storyteller, loved to talk about history. And though he had uh, gone only to the sixth grade, he loved to read history and talk about history. And uh, he had stories about the Civil War and about the Revolution and about the Cherokee Indians and uh, about the family in the old days. Two of his heroes, his two greatest heroes, were Daniel Boone and Theodore Roosevelt. My dad was born in 1905 in the administration of Theodore Roosevelt. He called him Teddy. And he loved to talk about all the great things that Teddy had said and done, the Panama Canal, his, his work in conservation, and the way, given a pulpit, a bully pulpit, he could preach just about anywhere about the nation and the future. And of course, Daniel Boone, uh, his hero of the frontier. My dad was a kind of Daniel Boone, actually. He loved to hunt and trap and tramp in the woods. And sort of like Daniel Boone, he failed at all of his business enterprises and didn't much care because that gave him an excuse to go back to the woods and to be the kind of woodsman that he wanted to be. And my dad always said we were related to Boone through his mother, who was a Morgan. I never believed that, but it turns out to be true. Two genealogists have sent me uh, genealogists showing that we have a common ancestor way back in uh, North Wales called Llewellyn App Morgan. So there is that distant relation to Daniel Boone. But I have been uh, on book tour from coast to coast, and in every single audience but one, there has been a relative or descendant of Daniel Boone. It is a big family. <laughs> Any descendants or relatives of Boone in this audience? Uh, are we going to break the record uh, here? It's my opinion that everybody in America is related to Daniel Boone and has a Cherokee grandmother, <laughs> probably, <laughs> who was a princess. Uh, uh, well, there are a lot of connections, of course, between Daniel Boone and Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, they're parallel in many ways. Uh, uh, Roosevelt knew the legend of Boone in the 19th century. You can see that and uh, saw him in the context of his own time. And of course, that's part of the complexity and the interest of history is that we do tend to see the past in our own terms. We, we understand the past in our own terms, and that's exactly what uh, Theodore Roosevelt and the historians of his time were doing. But in fact, they did have an awful lot of things in common, and I will try to touch on some of those things. In fact, Boone was a great hero of Theodore Roosevelt. I believe he devotes three chapters of The Winning of the West uh, to Roosevelt, and uh, I'll read a short passage from one of those chapters uh, after a while. But uh, Daniel Boone, was born in Ole, Pennsylvania, outside Reading, to a Quaker family in 1734. And uh, grew up there from the time he was a boy. People who knew him described him as in some ways different. And one of the ways he was different was that he slipped away into the woods 
for hours and later for days and then for weeks and, and as he got older for months even to walk in the woods, to hunt, to study the ways of the forest and to study the ways of the Indians, including the Shawnee Indians who lived there in Pennsylvania at that time. And he apprenticed himself to the Indians and to the hunters who lived like Indians from his youth. And he had a particularly close relationship with Indians. He's almost unique in the history of the frontier in his great rapport with Native Americans. He was sometimes called a white Indian. He absorbed an enormous amount of the culture and even the spiritual beliefs of the Indians. Uh, whereas most frontiersmen felt themselves the enemies of Indians, Boone often fit in and could get along with them quite well. Now I've been asked a number of times why a new book about Daniel Boone, there are many books about Daniel Boone, why is he relevant to our culture and to our time? And two, why a biography and not a novel? After all, I am best known as a novelist. The answer to the first question is, I've always been interested in Boone since I was a child, hearing my dad's stories about him, and working on that little farm on the Blue Ridge Mountains, I would turn up arrowheads and pieces of pottery, and it seemed to me, even as a kid, that the ground was haunted by the Indians, by the Cherokees and the other Indians who had been there. So I've always been interested in that connection to the Indians, to the past, and to the American landscape, and I knew that Boone was a particularly important person in the contact between the white people and the Indians. He was adopted by the Shawnees at one point. He became Sheltoe, Big Turtle of the Chillicothe Shawnees, and he always was a member of that nation the rest of his life. It's very likely he had a Cherokee wife. He was very close to the Cherokees in North Carolina. That's why he was hired as a diplomat to negotiate with the Cherokees by Judge Richard Henderson in uh, 1775. I wanted to see if I could peel away the folklore and the fake lore, the myths and legends, the Walt Disney movies, the Fess Parker TV series, and find a living, breathing human being that we in the 21st century could relate to and understand. And it seemed better to do that in nonfiction than in a novel. After all, if I presented a portrait of Boone that was not what people expected, in a novel, they could say, oh, he's just taken liberties. It's a novel. But if I have the quotes, if I have the end notes and the bibliography, I think it would, uh, it would have more credence uh, with readers. And besides, 25 years ago, I had done a lot of research on Boone and the Frontier for a long poem, which never got written, but I had kept that research and I wanted to get back to that. Uh, and perhaps in my old age, I'm more interested in history maybe than in making up stories. I, they tell me that happens uh, as you get older. You get more and more interested in, in history. Uh, Boone was different, even as a boy. He would slip away into the woods to hunt. But when he returned to the settlement, he was very popular. He was a devoted family person. He was a leader. And in that combination is the complexity of Daniel Boone and to some extent the contradiction of his life. This is sort of the theme of my talk. His dream was to live in the forest with the Indians, hunting in the pristine wilderness, but to have his family fairly close by. It was an ideal he actually achieved four times in his life. First in the Yadkin Valley of North Carolina in the mid-18th century, again in Kentucky in the 1770s, in Western Virginia two decades later, and at the end of his life in Missouri where he moved in 1799. Now the problem was that Boone was very famous, even as a young man, and wherever he went, other settlers would follow, they would pour in, chop down the trees, kill the game, drive the Indians out, 
So there was only this window of time when he could achieve that ideal, to live in the forest with the Indians, to hunt with the Indians, to hunt by himself often for long periods, but to have his family not too far away. And you can see how that's relevant to the issue of conservation, right? I'll come to that later. But this is the crux. This is the contradiction in Boone's life. He was described in his early fame as the instrument for the settlement of the West. And as an old man interviewed out in Missouri, he said, but I know I have been the instrument for the destruction of the Indians' hunting ground. He said, while I could never trust a Yankee, by which he meant Americans, I was never lied to by an Indian. So Boone is very unusual in his rapport, in his connection to Native Americans. He respected them, and they came to respect him. They recognized that. Uh, well, in 1750, when Boone was about 16, his family took the great migration across the Susquehanna River, down to the Potomac, up the Shenandoah Valley, to a place they call Big Lick. We call it Roanoke, Virginia. And there they crossed the Blue Ridge Mountains into the Yadkin Valley of North Carolina. They followed the path at that time called the Great Wagon Road, which followed Athiomiovi, the warrior's path, the trail of the armed ones, which followed a buffalo trail. <laughs> now, uh, following the wagon road came US Highway 11. Following that came Interstate 81. Now remember when you drive on Interstate 81 that you're following the wagon road, <laughs> the wilderness road, which followed the warrior's path, which followed a buffalo trail. And so many of our great highways in this country actually follow buffalo trails because the buffalo through the thousands of years found the easiest ways to go, the passes that were easiest to go through, and the best places to ford the rivers. And I love to think of this co continent as written on by the Indian roads, highways, trails, and the buffalo trails. And our network of roads, to a large extent, actually follows that. It was in the Yadkin Valley of North Carolina that Boone became a famous hunter. Even in his late teens, he was already famous. And one of my questions was, why did Boone become so famous? There were hundreds, even thousands of frontiersmen. What was it about Daniel Boone that made him so famous and remembered by everybody? And one answer to that is Boone himself, who, like Theodore Roosevelt was a wonderful storyteller and something of an actor, as was Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> and they both knew how to dress the part. <laughs> uh, we ha actually have a record of how Boone dressed when he was serving in the Virginia legislature in 1781. He's there with Jefferson and Patrick Henry and Randolph, and they're wearing silks and brocade. And there's Daniel Boone sitting in the legislature in Richmond wearing not a buckskin hunting shirt, but the kind of linsey, woolsey hunting shirt that hunters really wore. Buckskin shirt, when it gets wet, is just not very comfortable at all. So what they actually wore was a hunting shirt made out of cloth and buckskin leggings. And there he is sitting in the legislature with these leggings made by Shawnee women with fine beadwork on them and moccasins. Now somebody who dresses like that in the legislature is gonna be remembered. And that's exactly what Theodore Roosevelt did here. He got all that buckskin shirt, a silver uh, handle pistol and, and a Bowie knife and uh, leggings uh, he, and the big hat. He dressed the part. They're very similar in that way. And they both became famous when they were very young because they knew how to act the part. Uh, I believe that uh, Daniel Boone was what I call a verbal chameleon. He could talk when he was talking to backwoodsmen, like a backwoodsman when talking to Jefferson. He could talk more proper. 
And when he was talking to Indians, he could talk Indian talk in several senses. We have good evidence that when things were really rough, when there was about to be an attack, when at a moment of great crisis, Daniel Boone could stand up before a hundred angry Indians and talk the big talk. That's what the Indians called it, like a chief. He could say, my brothers, I'm delighted to see you. We will never be enemies. We will always hunt together and live together. Long as water runs downhill and grass grows green in spring and the stars hang in the heavens, we will be friends and we will hunt and trap together and nobody will ever make us enemies. He could talk them around. That's why he wasn't a great Indian fighter. He could usually talk his way out of these confrontations and the Indians understood that he respected them and usually did not kill or scalp. That's how he survived so long. And when they demanded his furs, his hoard of beaver skins and deer hides, and his fine Pennsylvania rifle, which they would trade for their cheap musket, he would hand it over cheerfully and say, I'm delighted to see you. And then he would pass his flask and, they, and smoke the peace pipe. So they liked him. He had a marvelous rapport with Native Americans. Very unusual. Simon Kenton, another great frontiersman, had a bad temper, would get mad at the Indians and just barely escape with his life more than once uh, in dealing with them. Uh, a great thing happened to Daniel Boone in 1755 in what we call the French and Indian War. He joined the militia and served under Colonel George Washington. It was only 23 years old, commander of the Virginia militia under Edward Braddock, and therefore marched to Braddock's defeat on the Monongahela. Barely escaped with his life, had to cut his horse loose and ride out of there as the arrows and bullets were flying. But on the way to the Monongahela, Boone met a young Irish trader named John Finlay who had been down the Ohio River and traded with the Indians at the falls at Louisville. And he told these stories by the campfire of this paradise, this promised land over the Alleghenies down the Ohio called Kentucky by the Iroquois, meaning the level land, Kentucky. The Shawnees called their settlement there Eskipakathiki, meaning the blue limestone lick place but if you had a choice between calling a place Kentucky or Eskipakathiki, which would you choose? And that's exactly what the white people did. <laughs> they called it Kentucky, and it's been called that ever since. There were beaver, buffalo, elk, deer, cane, clover, bluegrass. It was paradise. And there were no Indian towns there. The white people didn't understand there were no Indian towns there because the Iroquois had killed all the Indians who tried to settle there in the Great Fur Wars. It was their buffalo hunting preserve, and other Indians would hunt there, but they would slip in and out rather quickly. Everybody wanted Kentucky. Washington wanted it. Patrick Henry wanted it. Jefferson wanted it. The governors of the colonies wanted it. The French wanted it. The British wanted it. It was considered the promised land. And Boone devoted himself from then on to getting to the West. English settlers had been trapped on the eastern side of the Alleghenies for 150 years, but they wanted to get across. Everybody wanted to get to the West. And this dream of the West that Theodore Roosevelt inherited has a long history. Theodore Roosevelt was not the first person who believed that health and sanity lay in the West. In some ways, that dream goes all the way back to the Romans, who dreamed of Gaul and Britain, to the Normans, who dreamed of Wales and Ireland, to the Irish, who dreamed of Iceland, to the Vikings, who dreamed of Iceland and Greenland and Labrador, and to the settlers on the East Coast, who dreamed of the Ohio, which the French had named La Belle Riviere, the beautiful river. And Jefferson says it outright in his notes in the state of Virginia, the Ohio is the most beautiful river in the world. He just says it like that. Everybody wanted Ohio. The truest line in the movie, The Patriot, which is a mess as far as history goes, 
But when the bad guy is told he's done such awful things, he can never return to Britain in honor, but will be given land in the new world, he says, let's talk about Ohio. <laughs> that is absolutely on the money. That's what everybody was talking about, the Ohio Valley. Well, it took Boone 14 years to actually get to the bluegrass because it was so dangerous. And it was not clear how you got there. You could go up to the forks and go down the Ohio River. You could cross the mountain passes in Kentucky, but it was very dangerous and very expensive. And he probably didn't get there until he was funded by Judge Richard Henderson, who wanted to buy Kentucky from the Indians, from the Cherokees. Now, the Cherokees didn't own Kentucky, but they were happy to sell it to him and did in the 1775. Uh, so Theodore Roosevelt, in his quest of the West in the 1880s, was following a pattern long established that you go to the West, the Golden West, the Promised Land, and that's the place of health. It's the place of sanity. It's the place of growth. It's how you grow. It's how you become bigger somehow in the West. It is the American dream, going back to the very beginning. And the other nationalities, too. Uh, I will just read you one very short paragraph from this biography of Daniel Boone. It's the beginning of a chapter called Kentucky Was the Key. I like that. Key, Kentucky was the key. It's easy to forget in the 21st century the significance for the English-speaking Eastern communities of the settling and holding of Kentucky. The bluegrass region was valuable in itself almost beyond description as a place to claim and build farms and towns and future cities and great wealth. Explorers and speculators and leaders at the time understood that a foothold in Kentucky served as a buffer against the Indians, against the British to the north, and perhaps the Spanish to the west and south. But even more than that, a settled Kentucky promised to open the whole Ohio Valley to settlement. Some Indians seemed to grasp this threat implicitly and fought with tenacity, courage, and imagination the forts and stations the farmers and surveyors in the great meadow. They seemed to perceive from the first that once their buffalo hunting grounds in the bluegrass were claimed and cleared, the land north of the Ohio would be next. Other native leaders, such as Cornstalk of the Shawnees, were willing at first to accommodate the English settlers and did not foresee an inexorable tidal wave of westward expansion for the whites. Nothing could have been more exhilarating, more intoxicating than the taking and keeping of the land across the barrier of mountains. For once that hurdle was finally surpassed, after 150 years of hesitating and yearning in the east, the great river valleys of the central continent would be within reach. Filson described Kentucky as the best tract of land in North America and probably in the world. The Ohio Valley was more beautiful and contained more land than anyone had mapped or measured. And beyond lay the Illinois country, the fertile Mississippi Valley stretching almost to Canada in the north and to New Orleans in the south. And beyond the Mississippi, reports were heard of an even bigger river valley, the Missouri, that reached far into a mythical west and whispered rumors of mountains so high their tips sparkled with snow in July. But whatever lay beyond in the sunlit pastures and hills of coming years, Kentucky was the key, the first west. Kentucky was the threshold, the beachhead to who knew what playlands and empires of the future farther west. As I said earlier, the fame of Boone drew more and more settlers following him when he finally got into Kentucky. And uh, I guess he brought more than 200 people with him in 1779, including Abraham Lincoln's grandfather, Abraham Lincoln. There were three marriages between the Lincolns and the Boones, very closely related. So the president, Abraham Lincoln, was related by blood to Daniel Boone. And uh, one of Boone's closest friends in Lexington, Kentucky, was, uh, was Levi Todd, who was the grandfather of Mary Todd Lincoln. Uh, all kinds of connections uh, between these people. 
But Boone lost everything in Kentucky. And most of the other frontiersmen did. As the population grew and grew, and there were lawsuits over land boundaries, and often scholars, including some very distinguished ones, say Boone lost his land because he was an incompetent surveyor. I dug up his survey notes and his plats. You can go to the land office. He was as good a surveyor as anybody. He didn't shoot the celestial meridian, that is the North Star, but he, he used the compass. And if you're doing long, long lines, it's better to, to set your callings to the North Star. But uh, he could do the calculations. The problem was there were no good maps of Kentucky, so the land office didn't know where these, these tracks were, so they were overlapped. And Boone didn't like trouble. He wouldn't fight in court. And if somebody sued him, he would just give him the land. And not only that, he would loan money to people. He was like an Indian or a hunter. He would share whatever he had with people. If somebody needed money and he had it, he would give it to them. He gave his children and his friends land, and as a result, in a very aggressive world, farms worked by slaves in Kentucky in the late 18th century, he lost everything. And toward the end of his life, was offered a tract of land in Missouri by the Spanish governor. And, uh, said, if I had a choice between putting my head on the block and having it chopped off or returning to Kentucky, I would take the former. <laughs> he was bitter about what had happened to Kentucky. It had turned into a world very different from the wilderness he had sought. Remember that combination, he always sought the wilderness and his family nearby. In fact, I say in the book that uh, a wilderness without Indians was a contradiction in terms, because as soon as the Indians were driven out, the settlers would pour in, chop down the trees, kill the game, and it was no longer a wilderness. And in this way, the story of Daniel Boone is the story of this country, what I call a conflict of loyalties. We love nature, we love the wilderness, we don't destroy it because we hate it, we love it, but it's in conflict with our desires for progress and development. And that's where Theodore Roosevelt comes in. <laughs> this was a great dilemma. And it was Theodore Roosevelt who finally figured out how to address this contradiction in American culture through conservation and reclamation. It's, it's one of the many reasons Theodore Roosevelt is so important in American history. He's also the man who saw that the Panama Canal would be there. He, he negotiated the treaty between Japan and uh, Russia. And uh, he was lucky to have a Secretary of State who was a great man of genius also, John Hay, who helped him negotiate those treaties. You know, John Hay was Lincoln's secretary, his assistant secretary, and with Nikolai wrote the great biography of Lincoln. Uh, he's one of the great men of American history. Hardly anybody knows who John Hay was, but uh, Roosevelt inherited him from McKinley. He was McKinley's Secretary of State, and uh, you just can't think of a greater diplomat, really, than, uh, than John Hay. And he negotiated a lot of that for, with uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, I want to read you one more short passage from the biography uh, and, and uh, then talk a little bit more about Theodore Roosevelt. In his old age, Boone moved to Missouri, which was Spanish and then French territory. And I must say, one of the high points of my research on this book was going to the Missouri Historical Society in St. Louis and filling out a form and being given two boxes of documents it's called the Boone Family File. And you open up the first one, and there's this brown, very old piece of paper with purple ink on it from Le Gouverneur de la Sue, uh, Monsieur Daniel Boone, <laughs> giving him his tract of land in St. Charles County on the Famosage Creek. And it's, it's you know, you're, you're holding the original. I mean, you really, you literally touch history looking at those documents, all in French. Uh, it was uh, French territory. Boone was given a great tract of land there. When the Americans bought Louisiana, 1803, 1804, 
They stripped him of his land there, again, because he hadn't cleared any, any parcel of it and he hadn't built a house on it. He's a very old man by then. But he loved Missouri. The reason was it was still wilderness. There were still Indians there. His Shawnee family had moved out there. He hunted with his Shawnee family and with other Indians. He could paddle up the Missouri River. He could paddle up the tributaries into uh, Kansas and, and Iowa. And once, apparently, went as far as the Yellowstone on a hunting and trapping expedition. Uh, it, and he dreamed of the Pacific. It was always the West, the West, the West. He was too old to go there. But he uh, said that he would watch people go up to Missouri who were going all the way up and look longingly at the West. Uh, we don't know where he was when Lewis and Clark went up the river in the, in the spring of uh, 1804. My own theory is that he was away on a hunting trip and was not at home. That's why they don't mention him. He wasn't there. But his favorite hunting companion was an African-American named Derry Coburn. And he and Coburn hunted together so much that they didn't need to speak. They could communicate to each other. They understood each other. Now, he had a long history of, of hunting with African-Americans. The man who showed him the trails into the western waters in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina was a slave herder named Burrell right where Appalachian State University is, Boone, North Carolina. There was a cabin there, and Burl herded cattle and sheep for his owner, and he knew the trails, the Indian trails, the buffalo trails into the western waters, and it was Burl who guided Boone and Nathaniel Gist into the waters of the Watauga and the New River, as Boone was seeking to go further and further west. It was Uncle Monk Estill in Kentucky, who they say taught Boone to make gunpowder. It's very important on the frontier to be able to make gunpowder. He was also, by the way, a gunsmith. He could make rifles and he could repair them, which made him seem like a magician to the Indians. He could repair their guns. But uh, Coburn and Boone hunted up the Missouri and its tributaries for years. He lived to be very old. When he was about 80 years old, he and Coburn were hunting deep in the woods, and he was stricken with something. We don't know exactly what it was, maybe a heart attack, maybe a stroke. And Coburn went back to get his son, Nathan, who assumed his father had died, and ordered a coffin to be made as he went to get the body. But Boone had not died. In fact, he had rallied and was able to return with Nathan. And when he saw the coffin Nathan had ordered, Boone was not at all pleased. <laughs> Made of plain boards, it was too rough and uncouth. For all of his modesty and good manners, Boone had a sense of style and dignity. The plain coffin was used for a relative. And Boone ordered a fine coffin made for himself to match the one he had commissioned for Rebecca in 1813. Soon after this event, he gave directions to a cabinet maker in the settlement to prepare a coffin of black walnut for himself, which was done accordingly. And it was kept in his dwelling for years, John Mason Peck would write. But according to Peck, Boone later decided the walnut coffin was not good enough either. He gave that coffin for someone else's burial and ordered an even better one for himself. Quote, another of cherry was prepared and placed under his bed where it continued until it received his mortal remains. The cherry coffin was a handsome piece of work, and the old man took pleasure in showing it off. Elizabeth Corbin, sister of Daniel Morgan Boone's wife, Sarah, later told Draper the coffin appeared marvelously beautiful. The fame of it spread among the simple-minded settlers, and it had exceedingly numerous visitors. Later, the coffin was stored in Nathan's new stone house, but from time to time, Boone would take it out to admire and study. His granddaughter, Delinda, later remembered that he would rub and polish it up and coolly whistle while doing it. Others said he would lie down in the coffin to show how well it fit him, and sometimes he would take a nap in it, scaring the children. 
<laughs> I found that story in a book called The Pioneers of Missouri, published in 1840, <laughs> just full of great anecdotes like that. Uh, part of the fun of doing history is you never know where you're going to find things, right? Sometimes in the most unexpected uh, places. Uh, and speaking of Theodore Roosevelt, I was sitting in the barber chair two weeks ago. And the barber, who loves to talk, said, uh, do you know who is the only president in our history who never used the word I in his inaugural address? And I said, no. He said, Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> How about that? Uh, I mean, I, I don't think of Roosevelt as a modest person, but I do think he was so passionate about his issues and causes that it really wasn't egotism. I mean, it was, it was the issue that was important to him. Uh, much more than himself personally. There was, there was a selflessness about him, which I also associate with Daniel Boone, that there are many differences between the men and many similarities, I think, in, in their, their passion to help others, in their great curiosity to explore and to know, to find out, to connect with. Uh, but you can see in, in Roosevelt's writing about the frontier that he is also very much a man of his time. He doesn't have the kind of interest, say, in, in American Indian culture that we do. But he's not alone in that. I mean, that would be true. Uh, the man who's often described as the greatest biographer of Boone is, is uh, uh, Bakeless, uh, John Bakeless, hardly mentions Indians. This book was published in the 1930s, except as those savages on the frontier. I mean, he had no interest, really, in the Indian culture that Boone was in contact with, uh, including the Shawnee culture. So history changes, and the past changes as time changes, and we look back. And uh, I was sitting on a panel with a historian, uh, Michael Wallace, in Tulsa two weeks ago, and somebody said, uh, do you consider your biography of uh, Billy the Kid the definitive one? And, he said, uh, there's no such thing as a definitive book of history, that it keeps growing. And uh, then I said, no, we wouldn't even want a definitive book because we want to keep discovering the evolution of history as part of its fascination. That it's never over. It's back then, but it's still alive as we investigate it. I thought I would read to you a, a very short passage of uh, Theodore Roosevelt writing about Daniel Boone to give you uh, some sense of this, this difference. Uh, in chapter three of The Winning of the West, uh, Roosevelt wrote, finally, however, among these long hunters, one arose whose wanderings were to bear fruit, who was destined to lead through the wilderness the first body of settlers that ever established a community in the far west, completely cut off from the seaboard colonies. With Boone, hunting and exploration were passions, and the lonely life of the wilderness, with its bold, wild freedom, the only existence for which he really cared. His thoughtful, quiet, pleasant face was the face of a man who never blustered or bullied, who would neither inflict nor suffer any wrong, and who had a limitless fund of fortitude endurance and indomitable resolution on which to draw when fortune proved adverse. His self-command and patience, his daring, restless love of adventure, and in time of danger, his absolute trust in his own powers and resources all combined to render him peculiarly fitted to follow the career of which he was so fond. That's pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> uh, he understood what a peaceable person Boone was. He'd been raised by Quakers, and uh, he always sought to avoid trouble if he possibly could, and often lost out in business dealings uh, because of it. But I think, I think Roosevelt picked up on that. He, he was a remarkably modest person, actually. And it's interesting that he became such a leader when the arrows were flying, the bullets were flying, when there was trouble, everybody turned to Daniel Boone, even though there were men who outranked him present. And this made some people very jealous of him. Richard Calloway actually charged him with treason because he was so friendly with Indians 
and uh, he, he liked people. Uh, one of the things I discovered about Boone that no other historian had ever paid any attention to was he was a Freemason, and that was a part of the revolutionary spirit of, of the 18th century. Washington was a Freemason, Lafayette was a Freemason, von Steuben was a Freemason, Nathaniel Green was a Freemason. Uh, it was a very important thing, a sense of brotherhood that transcended class, ethnicity, uh, and included people from other uh, races even. There were African Americans who were initiated in, in lodges and uh, American Indians. The great Mohawk chief, Joseph Brandt, was a Freemason, for instance. Uh, on the night of December 16, 1773, the Masonic Lodge in Boston is empty, but there's some guys dressed up as Indians tossing tea into Boston Harbor. <laughs> so there was that connection between the Revolution and Freemasonry. Well, I wanted to, uh, to save some time for questions. Uh, uh, I'll be happy to, uh, to answer questions if, if you have them. Uh, often uh, people have, have uh, lots of questions about these historical figures. Uh, First of all, thank you. And please just raise your hand, speak uh, boldly, and then please repeat the questions because we're taping this. So who has the first question for Robert Morgan? Yes, here. My sense is that he, uh, he, he got what was well known at that time, but did not dig, uh, for instance, into the Draper collection in Wisconsin. Uh, scholars such as Draper resented Roosevelt, uh, possibly because he wasn't an academic or something, but he, they didn't think he dug very deeply into the documents. There's an ocean of documents about Boone. And the first uh, historian to draw on them was Reuben Gold Thwaites, who was an associate of Draper at that, uh, the Wisconsin Historical Society. Uh, Lyman Draper spent his life collecting documents in the Ohio Valley, interviewing pioneers and their children and their friends. And people say he vacuumed up, he begged, borrowed, bought. Some people say stole <laughs> everything practically. And it is an amazing collection of letters uh, uh, notebooks, uh, the account books of Daniel Boone. I mean, I've, I've confirmed several of my surmises about Boone by going to those account books that Draper got. So I would say uh, Roosevelt was, was good, but he was working mostly with what was pretty well known at that time. He was not digging into those survey notes and plats and account books. Uh, the question was, how, how deep did Roosevelt um, study the document base and how accurate was his portrait? So we're going to repeat the questions just so everyone can hear. Go ahead. Why not a more traditional Native American burial ritual since he was so close to Indians? Because the burial was in the, in the charge of his family there and his daughter Jemima and Nathan and his uh, grandson-in-law James Craig, who was a Baptist, preached the funeral. And uh, I wondered about that. I could not find any, any note on it or any indication that they let his Indian relatives know. The, the Shawnees had become ranchers and, and lived pretty much like white people there and had driven out the Osages and the other local Indians also. Uh, but I could not find any reference to that. His son, Nathan, says he had no military or Masonic honors because there was not a lodge nearby. Uh, uh, it would have been appropriate uh, for his uh, Shawnee family to have been involved, but I don't think they even let them know. Uh, the, you know, of course, the great controversy about Boone's burial is where is he buried? <laughs> it's a question I've been asked most often. He was buried on, uh, on a little hill overlooking uh, Charette Creek and over the bottomlands toward the Missouri beside his wife Rebecca in 1820 when he died. And in 1840s, a delegation came from Kentucky to dig up the bodies and bring them back to, uh, to Kentucky to put under that monument, cross the hill in the cemetery at Frankfurt. Uh, the family 
and uh, the, the citizens of Missouri were so outraged, they said, and say to this day, they got the wrong bodies, and that uh, Daniel and Rebecca are still buried on Charette Creek. Short of digging up the remains and doing DNA tests, I don't know any way to resolve this, but I'm careful what I say in Missouri or uh, Kentucky. <laughs> Very passionate stuff. Uh, John Worcester. Yeah, why did the Spanish and the French want Boone as a settler, and what did he think about these land transfers? The Louisiana Territory comes back to the U.S. in 1803. Uh, that is a very good question, and one of the answers is that the Spanish and then the French were very much afraid that the British would invade out of Canada and come down the Mississippi River to take New Orleans. Everybody wanted New Orleans. Whoever controlled New Orleans controlled the interior of the continent. And their best bet, they figured, since they could not maintain a very big army there, was to get Americans to settle in Missouri, upper Louisiana, to form a buffer, because who had defeated the British in the Revolution? But the same thing, the Mexican government brought in all those Anglos into Texas, uh, not realizing if you got enough Americans into Missouri, it was almost certain going to become. But I think that was the main reason. They wanted settlers also as a buffer against the hostile Indians in the Missouri Valley there, the Kansas and the Osages. Uh, but they, f they figured that Boone was so popular, and they figured rightly, that wherever he went, thousands of other Yankees would pour in. Uh, what was the second part of your question? Well, the question is, what did he think of uh, the Louisiana Purchase? I know he wanted to leave the United States when he did, that he was disgusted with the way things had gone. He did not think it was the country that he had, he had desired. Uh, and uh, look what happened once the, the United States took over Louisiana. They stripped him of his land, stripped him of his title. He was the syndic of the area. He was the administrator, like the, like the justice of the peace, and was treated with great respect by the Spanish and the French, mostly the French, uh, and the Indians. Uh. Other questions? Missing somebody? Back there, yes. You know, when did Boone leave reality into mythology? <laughs> well, it began to happen in his own lifetime when a man named John Filson came to Kentucky in uh, 1783. He decided to write a book about Kentucky to advertise land. He was a real estate person. He had invested land in Kentucky, and he found that the best informant was Daniel Boone, living on Marble Creek, just south of Lexington at that time. He was so charmed by Boone, everybody was charmed by Boone, that he appended to that little book, The Discovery and Settlement of Kentucky, The Adventures of Colonel Daniel Boone. Purports to be an autobiography. And my opinion is it's a collaboration, and it is a classic work. It's, it's really a kind of masterpiece modeled to some extent on Robinson Crusoe, in my opinion, extremely romantic. It begins, curiosity is natural to the soul of man. <laughs> and Boone says in, in 1769, I went in quest of the country of Kentucky. <laughs> I mean, he saw this as a quest, a very romantic thing. So Boone helped create the legend. The romantics pushed it even further. This little book impressed the French and the British as well as people in North America. Jefferson read it in Paris. Uh, the French intellectuals who, and European intellectuals starting the Romantic movement cast Boone as the great natural man, the man of the wilderness, the man who could get along with the Indians. And then in the 19th century, biographers such as Timothy Flint and John Mason Peck continued this uh, so that uh, Boone became the icon of what was best in America, the person who could live, who could go into the wild and live, and who could get along with the Indians, who could learn from the Indians, 
And uh, this is a very important thing. I mean, uh, if, if you came to this continent as an indentured servant, as a peasant, you had never been allowed to hunt. You could be hanged in England for killing a deer that belonged to the royalty, the nobility. You'd never worn furs, and you were suddenly in a place where there was unlimited hunting and furs. Who would teach you that? The Indians over there. You were, you were trading with the Indians, fighting with the Indians, sleeping with the Indians. The intermarrying was, was very quickly, and the Indians practiced a kind of democracy, and I suspect some of that rubbed off. Not Time for just a couple more. Okay. Yes? Uh, I think uh, he was away hunting and was not at home. Otherwise, they would have stopped to see him and probably recorded it. Uh, we don't really know. I have no proof of that. But since he was away with Derry Coburn hunting a lot of the time, he'd be gone for weeks and even months hunting. I suspect that's what it was. See, he did his deer hunting in the summertime and his fur trapping in the wintertime. And he probably had gone off to start his deer hunt when they came through there. Uh, by the way, a deer hide in those days was worth a Spanish dollar. So a dollar came to be called a buck <laughs> in the 18th century. We'll do one more, and then I have a question. Oh, two more. Go ahead here. Yeah, to what extent did Boone learn native languages? He spoke Indian in several senses, and we know he knew enough Cherokee to understand the Cherokees because he negotiated with them, with the great chief Atakulakula and Oconostota uh, at, at Watauga and at other times, and he certainly knew some Shawnee also. He lived with them, and I'll give you an example of proof that he could talk Shawnee, that in, I think it's in 1786, uh, George Rogers Clark had ordered an attack on the Shawnee towns on the little uh, Miami River, north of Cincinnati, and Boone was a part of that as a scout or something, and uh, they take the village of Piqua, one of the capital towns, and they've captured the great chief Melantha, who was very old, and the woman chief. There was always a woman chief. Few people know that. It's a war chief, political chief, and a woman chief. The woman was in charge of the woman things, the, the agriculture, the ceremonies, the children, that sort of thing. Okay, they have these prisoners, including Nautilima, the, the sister of the great chief Cornstalk, and they're chatting. Boone is always telling jokes. He was called wide mouth by the Cherokees because his mouth was always open laughing and telling jokes and stories. And they're smoking the pipe and talking about the old days in Chillicothe. And Hugh McGarry is very angry because he's been, been accused of creating the debacle of the Battle of uh, Blue Legs, where so many Kentuckians were killed. And he runs up and he shouts to Melantha, was you at the Blue Legs? Melantha doesn't know a word of English. Now Boone has been standing there talking and telling jokes to him. And Melantha has no idea what Hugh McGarry has said. He's trying to be friendly. He reaches out his hand. He's nodding. And McGarry takes an ax and says, I will show you Blue Lick's play, and splits his head open. And then he turns to kill non Halima and Boone, and Simon Kenton grab him. But clearly Boone was standing there talking to Melantha, talking about the old days. Melantha doesn't know a word of English, so this proves it. And how about sign, Indian sign? There were various lingua francas and sign language they could use also. So let's, do, he, let's do one more. Now, Roosevelt's deep curiosity about nature, um, do you find the same thing in Boone? Exactly. Boone was interested in the wild, in the wilderness, in the Indians. He had an enormous respect for people different from him. He had a, he had a, a kind of a tolerance that was unusual, really in any time, but, but certainly in his time. And 
uh, I did not talk about the passage in my book where he spends two years alone in the wilderness of Kentucky, 1769, 1771, and my opinion is he did that because he couldn't tear himself away from this pristine wilderness. He was studying the animals, he was studying the mammoth bones, he was studying the caves, the springs, the salt springs, and uh, he just could not bear to go back to the Yadkin until he had explored the whole thing. So he was a naturalist in that sense, and that's another thing he, he shares with Theodore Roosevelt, this tremendous curiosity about the world, and particularly the natural world, and the Indian world. And when you read Thoreau, particularly writing about the wild, the wilderness, and solitude, it's like he's writing down what Boone had lived 100 years before, you know, in, in, in Wildness is the salvation of the world, the preservation of the world, and that sort of thing. Uh, the great romantics caught this, and of course, those were the people that Theodore Roosevelt had read at Harvard, uh, and, the, and the students of them. So it is a great lineage of this American romanticism, and the love of nature and the wilderness. Uh, it's a great element in Theodore Roosevelt's personality. It's hard to think of anybody more complex than Theodore Roosevelt, except for Jefferson. <laughs> Now, Jefferson had that kind of mind, this great scientific curiosity and a love of everything from commerce to languages to horticulture, uh, you name it, Jefferson and, and then Roosevelt uh, was into it and, and knew quite a bit about it. Let me ask you one last question before we take our break. You, I, as, a, as one of the organizers of an event like this, I'm always watching, listening to each lecture to hear what contributes to the ongoing question that we're trying to resolve, and one of them is how to place Roosevelt in the history of the conservation movement. And you said something I thought just extraordinarily useful in the phrase conflict of loyalties. And you, I, if I've got it right, you were saying that this conflict really has two elements. One is that we all know as Americans that wilderness is really somehow the core of our national experience, and yet our ongoing behavior is always a challenge to the existence of that wilderness, and it's embodied in Boone, and that wilderness means wilderness people, Native Americans, and we've had a very edgy relationship with those wilderness peoples. And then you said Roosevelt finally figured out how to address this problem. Can you just reflect a little more on that? Well, I think it's part of the genius of Theodore Roosevelt. I mean, he really thought about these. He understood these problems and these deep contradictions in our culture. And he always wanted to do something about it. If he saw there was a need to have a canal, he would do something about it. And he saw that our natural resources, our land, our water, and the great beauties of this country were really endangered. And he set out to do something about it. And it's incredible if you go down the list of things he did while president. He was only president, what, seven years? But, but all these parks and monuments, I mean, so much of what we have is what Roosevelt just did in, in that time. And, and can you imagine the country without that? What, what if you know, all these wonderful wilderness areas, national forest monuments had been spoiled and not made public land and not managed? Roosevelt understood that land had to be managed. You couldn't leave it just pristine wilderness. And he believed that forests should be harvested, but wisely and carefully, and that the resources should be used. So that's exactly what I'm saying, is that he found a pretty good solution to this great dilemma that Daniel Boone had lived, essentially. This contradiction between the love of the wild and the love of development and progress. And, uh, the future of civilization. Right? And that, that phrase, uh, conflict of loyalties, just perfectly sets up our afternoon discussion about the future of the Little Missouri River Valley here in the North Dakota Badlands. Thank you, Robert Morgan. We're going to take a 15-minute break. Thank you.